Hello. Welcome to the September edition of the Nutritionist webinar. I am Marianne Fesenden from Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems and serve as your American host. The purpose of these webinars is to provide access to technical seminars on a range of topics delivered by internationally recognized speakers. The series is a unique three-language presentation held in English, Portuguese, Spanish, and Spanish. Noted ruminant nutritionists will present in English, hosted by AMPS in the United States, while Marcelo Hens Ramos from 3R Lab simultaneously translates into Portuguese for Brazil, and Paula Torillo translates into Spanish for Argentina. There will be a post-presentation question and answer period during which listeners can submit questions through me or Marcelo and Paula. During the presentation, we will bring break twice to conduct four audience polls, the result of which will be discussed during the question and answer period. A complete recording of archived webinars, as well as the question and answer session for each, will be available on the 3R and AMTS. We're very pleased to host Adam Locke. Adam is an associate professor in the Department of Animal Science at Michigan State University. Originally from the United Kingdom, Dr. Locke received his PhD from the University of Nottingham and completed a postdoc at, the, at that institution as well as at Cornell University. He had a research and teaching appointment at the University of Vermont from 2006 to 2009 before moving to his current research and extension appointment at Michigan State University in the fall of 2009. Dr. Locke has developed his expertise in ruminant nutrition and physiology. His research and extension programs focus on both dairy production and human nutrition and health, and the interface between those, these two disciplines. The central theme is fatty acid digestion and metabolism in the dairy cow and the impact of bioactive fatty acids on animal production and human health. Current efforts concern the effect of diet on the production of biohydrogenation in the rumen, dietary strategies for maximizing fat, milk fat synthesis, applying this knowledge to improve our ability to troubleshoot on farm issues related to milk fat depression, fat supplement, supplementation opportunities, and the potential for omega-3 fatty acids to promote dairy cattle metabolism and health. The impact of milk and dairy products on human health in particular, the role of milk fat is also of special interest. He is recognized for his ability to communicate to many sectors, from the dairy farmers to dietitians, and was awarded the 2011 American Dairy Science Association Young Scientist Award, which recognizes outstanding research by a young dairy scientist during the first 10 years of their professional career. At, that, at this point, we will change to the presentation from Dr. Locke. Thank you very much for listening tonight. And Dr. Locke, I will pass the presentation to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, okay. So I realize the translators have a, a double trouble today having to translate my uh, very un-American accent here as well. So please, uh, <laughs> Please, please shout if I, I start speaking too fast. I know even some of my American colleagues try and correct me every day on my, uh, on my poor English. So I'm uh, very pleased to be able to uh, present this webinar. It's an excellent series that uh, AMTS and, and your affiliated colleagues have, have put together. So I hope this is a useful and helpful uh, seminar, uh, wherever you may be um, in the world here and uh, hopefully it generates some uh, good questions and some good discussion uh, later on. So I, I was asked to talk about <clears throat> fatty acids in dairy cow diets. I think we've made it. Yeah. Okay, ca I'll carry on here. So we made yeah. a number of advances uh, over the last 10, 15 years here. And I just wanna talk about some of our, uh, some of these areas that I feel may be important when we're trying to um, continually look uh, how to utilize fatty acid information from feeds and diets into our um, nutrition uh, formulation programs and also how we may better be able to feed uh, uh, dairy cattle with this information. What I'd like to talk about today is uh, just some general um, background on lipid digestion and metabolism and then sort of start talking about individual fatty acids. So I'm going to be using a lot 
of the common names for different fatty acids. We're going to be looking at uh, how some of our work with individual fatty acids uh, relates to um, effective production level and, and how that may impact response to fats. And then also some recent meta-analysis work that we've done. I'm going to be looking at uh, research that's used individual fatty acids that we've done and others have done. I'm also going to be looking at uh, uh, research that uh, utilized uh, commercially available fat supplements that are widely available most uh, most places in the world. So really, let's just start here with, uh, I think this is an informative table for everyone to remember. And I know in AMTS, for example, uh, using the CNCPS platform, it now has um, very robust uh, data for fatty acid profile of feedstuffs, and I'm going to continue continue to talk about that in a little as we go forward here. But really, just to talk about when we're talking about dietary fatty acids, we're really talking about these five fatty acids that I show that I show just across here: uh, palmitic acid here, 16-0, uh, stearic acid, 18-0. So these are our two predominant saturated fatty acids in diets, and I'm going to be talking about these two fatty acids much later when we're talking about supplementation of fat. But then our unsaturated fatty acids in the diet is oleic acid, 18-1, uh, and then linoleic acid, 18-2, um, which is also you'd be known, known as an omega-6 fatty acid, and then linolenic acid, 18-3, that we uh, know it that you would probably also have heard of as being an omega-3 fatty acid. So linoleic and linolenic acid are what we know as the two essential fatty acids for all mammals, including dairy cows. Now, what you will see here is that in the vast majority of the feeds that uh, certainly we feed in the U.S., the corn-based type feeds, uh, soybeans, etc., linoleic acid here is the predominant fatty acid. And it's only when we start looking at some more uh, pasture or grasses that we start to see more linolenic acid in, in the dairy cow diet. And then typically oleic acid is the other predominant fatty acid. So as you can see here, the majority of the fatty acids in dairy cow diets are unsaturated fatty acids. So my analogy of, I often use is that fats in plants are primarily unsaturated, whereas ruminant fats are mostly saturated. Uh, so the analogy here is we think of most of the lipid going into a dairy cow diet is corn oil, but what comes out in milk is butter. So we go from that unsaturated to a much more saturated uh, fat as in butter here. And the simple reason for this is that unsaturated fatty acids are toxic to rumen bacteria. So oleic, linoleic, linolenic acid, they actually have differing degrees of toxicity to rumen bacteria so they carry out these pr the processes of hydrolysis and biohydrogenation, which is simply um, the processes that convert unsaturated fatty acids to saturated fatty acids. <clears throat> so when we think of this, this process of biohydrogenation, it's not a one-stop single, st um, single step here. You have to get, go through this production of what we call these trans intermediates here. So, for example, oleic, linoleic, and linolenic acid, they all go through biohydrogenation and ultimately, hopefully, end up as stearic acid, 18-0. And this is simply this conversion of the, of the double bonds, here just showing here, just a double bond. So, for example, in linoleic acid, there are two of these double bonds, and through these different intermediates, we end up with a fully saturated uh, carbon here, and hence the name saturated fatty acid. So as I said, unsaturated fatty acids are toxic to rumen bacteria, and I think that's just a, a very good, simple take-home uh, uh, for, for, for this early biology we're discussing here. So the more unsaturated fatty acids in the dairy cow diet, the more detoxification they have, and, and to some extent, maybe some more issues that we may have with, with biohydrogenation pathways. Uh, this is, a, I'm not going into that. But all, all of this figure shows here nicely is that different fatty acids, and we all know there's a very huge number of different types of bacteria in the rumen, but different bacteria are more or less uh, susceptible to toxicity by different fatty acids. Here showing different bacteria and lin linoleic acid here. But what's interesting 
those um, bacteria that are most um, sensitive to linoleic acid are those in the Peter Fibrio groups, and they're the main species that comprise uh, the rumen cellulitic um, flora that uh, carry out uh, cellulo cellulitic. So those fatty acids, that, sorry, those bacteria that mostly uh, break down a lot of the fiber in the diet, they're the ones that are often most sensitive to. And this is just a cartoon picture that uh, we put together a number of years ago now, but just shows how extensive and uh, how good rumen bacteria are of doing this conversion of unsaturated to saturated fatty acids. Just here on, on, the, on the left over here, on the left here, you can see the arrow here, this is just showing uh, pre, where we broke up the available data into low, medium, or high intakes of linoleic acid in blue. And then in orange is the rumen outflow or the duodenal outflow of linoleic acid. So even though we increase vastly the amount of linoleic acid in the diet, we really get very little difference in the amount of linoleic acid um, actually leaving the rumen, as you can see with these three orange ones here that I just circled. On the other side of that, as you can show in green here, there's very little stearic acid in the diet unless you feed very specific fat supplements that we may talk about later on. But because of that process of biohydrogenation, you get very large amounts of, of stearic acid, sorry, leaving the rumen. So what I often remind people is that stearic acid, C18-0, under nearly all, under, under most typical feeding situations, it's going to be the predominant fatty acid available for absorption by the dairy cow, regardless of what type of diet is being fed. And that's because now biohydrogenation, and I'm sure many of you may have heard, um, seen some of these type of slides, is key here. Here I'm simply showing what I would call the normal biohydrogenation pathway, going linoleic acid down to stearic acid. And this here is actually the CLA isomer many of you may have heard about from having potential, potential benefits on human health. However, what we now know is that if you get some of these shifts in biohydrogenation going through down some of these alternative pathways, this CLA isomer is now the one, is one of the fatty acids we know that's produced in the rumen bacteria. That is a very potent inhibitor of fat synthesis in the mammary gland. So this is one, this is the fatty acid we know the most about that's responsible for what uh, many of us would call milk fat depression. So that time, that, those times when the bulk tank value may suddenly drop from a 3.8 down to a 3.4% fat for, within, a, within the space of three or four days. So we're now starting to understand more and more about the importance of how bi bacteria are biohydrogenating and to what some of these different intermediates that are being produced here and what biological effects they may have. So when we're talking about fatty acid nutrition and biology and specifically fat supplementation, we need to be very aware of some of these different pathways. Just simply showing here, this is a paper that will be, that will be published in, uh, later on this year. It'll be available online in Journal of Dairy Science very soon. A student of mine, Jackie Borman, uh, looked at um, fatty acid digestibility in the small intestine. And what I'm simply showing here is that when you look at intestinal digestibility, so even from the duodenum to the ileum or duodenum to the feces, we typically see, even though there's some significance here, very little effect on percent digestibility of, of our major fatty acids in the dairy cow. So stearic, palmitic, stearic, oleic, linoleic, and, and linolenic. And very little difference in these numbers you see circled here. But this only, what we're only, we're just realizing now, only really tells half the story about some of this digestibility work. And we need to do a better job at probably modeling this feature. The reason I say that is that when we look at fatty acid intake here on the x-axis, by fatty acid duodenal flow here, because there's, there's very little actual breakdown of fatty, long-chain fatty acids in the rumen, they may be converted to different fatty acids but bacteria do not break them down for energy or then, and they're not absorbed through the rumen wall. You see this very linear one to fairly one to one relationship here between uh, fatty acid intake. But what we're now starting to get a good understanding of is as we see more fatty acids coming out of the rumen, so looking here at total fatty acid duodenal flow, 
the total fatty acids here. We do see a slight depression <clears throat> here in total fatty acid intake. So anywhere from in the high 80s down to the um, into the medium 80s here down into the low 70s as we go through this fairly wide range of total fatty acid flow. But if you think back to the, the um, percent digestibilities I showed earlier, what this doesn't show us and what we're starting to see here, and especially in this next figure here, is that the, it, fatty, the flow of individual fatty acids coming out of the rumen can have very marked effects. And the one that was really pro prominent in this analysis and in this data set was the flow of stearic acid. Here shown in the flow of stearic acid on the x-axis here by digestibility, percent digestibility again here on the y-axis. You can see this very linear, very marked reduction in stearic acid percent digestibility based on how much stearic acid is actually coming out of the rumen. And this is something we need to follow up future and what potential impact this may have on, on choosing types of fat supplements to use as well. So then just taking this further now, we just consider milk fatty acids. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you are aware there's two sources of fatty acids um, that contribute to milk fat. There's those that we call de novo fatty acids. And this is our short and medium chain fatty acids, so butyrate all the way up to palmitic acid, produced directly in the mammary gland from chain elongation of acetate and butyrate. And then we have our preformed fatty acids, these are going to be some of the, the, the 16 carbon fatty acids and then all of the 18 carbon fatty acids and longer. So actually, it's just these 16 carbon fatty acids are the only ones that can come either from de novo or from preformed fatty acids. So that's just some of the intro biology that we've, uh, I wanted to just introduce there. I hope it uh, gives some background and then after the poll here, we're moving to some more, more specifics here of fat, fatty acid supplementation. Back to okay. you. Okay, terrific. I am going to, um, we're going to conduct a quick little poll. So the first poll is a diet that is formulated for 5% fat. A will have 5% fatty acids in it. B will vary from 4% to 6% fatty acids. C, fatty acid percent will vary depending upon the formulation, D, fatty acid percentage will depend on the management of the feed, and E, I do not know. I recommend the use of supplemental fat in dairy diets, A, to increase milk yield, B, to increase solids, C, to improve feed efficiency, D, to improve body condition score, and E, I do not recommend supplemental fat from the diet. I am going to turn the presentation back over to Dr. Locke. Uh, a couple of slides here that uh, Cumberland, Ralph Ward at Cumberland Valley um, uh, produced recently from uh, um, doing total fatty acids uh, from the last two years, just to show the range that we see here in, in total fatty acid content of, of diets, anywhere from you know two and a half all the way up to over to over six percent total fatty acids, and I think as we go more and more in the future, but we're go, going to be talking about fatty acid content of diet, and we need to move away from um, ether extract or crude fat. Now. And then if we look at unsaturated fatty acids, you can see the vast the majority, the majority of them are in this kind of range here from two up to three and a half. But we're getting some up here much higher in some of the, these values um, up over here. But being able to have Good predictions and good knowledge of this is going to be help, helpful, I think, in the ration formulation, but also when trying to maybe troubleshoot some issues. Where I think the issue can lie is maybe sometimes we don't actually truly know what level of fatty acid is in our diets. Um, and this is just shown here. This was for a, a nutrition company. I did some analysis for a couple of years ago where we just looked at um, eight different diets from eight different farms. And what the model predicted was the total fatty acid content of those diets versus what I measured by doing a GC analysis in my lab, so the wet chemistry. And we can see in the, most, in the majority, of these diff, majority of these, we were under predicting the amount of fatty acids in the diet. So I think we're going to go more and more in the future now of actually having, doing direct measures of fatty acids on 
that, as I said, the, many nutrition models now have very good knowledge of fatty acid profiles in different feeds. And from our own analysis, that really doesn't change a huge amount. But what does change, I'll show you some examples in the next few slides, is the actual total fatty acid content in many of our common feed ingredients uh, can change significantly. And if we're just using a book value in our model, uh, we may not have good knowledge of, of this. You know, so, for example, feeding 20% more fatty acids than what we're expecting can suddenly maybe be the reason why we're pushed into a low milk fat situation, for example. So I'm, I'm sure one of the first ones that comes to mind when you're thinking about it is uh, distiller's grains. And uh, as we and others here, this is a slide from uh, Mike Jarrett, who kindly let me borrow from a Midwest uh, meeting a few years ago. There's a big variation in the fatty acid content of distiller's grains. And while the, over the last few years, you can see in the black line here, there's been a reduction in total fatty acid content of distillers. Interestingly, though, the spread or the range has often got quite has got larger as we've made that drive to go to lower fat content of distillers grain. So this is obviously, I think, one ingredient to, to be aware of. And we saw that here. Uh, this is in a summary of about um, 20 um, distillers grains here, just showing here, here distillers grains. And in our analysis, this is from samples that uh, Cumberland Valley sent us for uh, GC analysis. We're ranging anywhere from 10 up to nearly 15% total fatty acid. We saw some range in cotton seed as well, but a much uh, smaller range. But the one that we saw a big range in that, su that surprised us somewhat was in canola. Averaged about 7% fatty acids. We had one sample that was all the way up at 18%, but the 75% uh, of the samples range from anywhere from about 3 up to 10% total fatty acids. Now, this may uh, be impacted on by whether it's chemical or mechanical extraction, et cetera, but having good, that, good knowledge on some of this, and when you may or may not be getting higher or lower fat contents in some of these byproducts, I think could be important. In now, it's not just our byproduct feeds um, that are an issue. Maybe we need to also have a good handle on our forages, I think. This is an example from the Netherlands a couple of years ago now, <clears throat> just looking at grass silage and corn silage. They averaged about similar here, total fatty acids. This is not E for extract, remember, this is total fatty acids. But the ranges here are quite significant, anywhere from less than 1 up to over 3% total fatty acids. Now, this, this may not seem like a large number in terms of percent dry matter, but when our forages are the major, major feed ingredients in the diet, I think we often forget that forages can, many, in many situations, be the major source of fatty acids in the diet. Uh, here's to, for anyone feeding fresh pasture here. Uh, I think this is an important uh, slide here. As we get through the stages of maturity of grass growth, as we can see here, uh, for rye and then for annual ryegrass, we can see reductions in total fatty acid content. So I often remember from my uh, father's own situation when we had first put cows out on the fresh, uh, lush pasture in the southwest of England, you know, we typically see, for example, some drops in milk fat. And I think some of that's related to the very high fatty acid content. I'd often... Uh, um, half joke, but it's, it's very true. I think often the highest fat content diet that you may feed a dairy cow is a is a is a dairy cow on fr just mostly getting fresh young pasture. You know, as we see here, up to nearly seven percent. We saw a similar variation here. This is uh, from some of our own work with about seventy corn silage samples from Michigan and Indiana. Average two point five percent dry matter total fatty acids, but this ranged from one point six. The 3.6% dry matter, so that can have quite a significant impact on total fatty acid. In and as I said earlier, the variation in the fatty acid profile is minimal. So if you recall from the tables earlier on, lin linoleic acid accounts for about 55% of total fatty acids in corn silage. The variation in this profile is minimal compared to the variation in total fatty acid concentrations. So I think hopefully more and more in the future, we, we can be get getting accurate lab analysis, whether this be NIR or, or wet chemistry, on total fat, fatty acid content of feed.
And I often think, for example, we'd never just accept the book value for NDF content of any of our forages or our feeds. And probably in the future, we won't be using just simply book values for fatty acids. <clears throat> so that's more, again, um, some more of this primer on some of the background here. But then just let's talk about feeding different fat supplements now. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but this is some of the reasons I hear from people why people may be choosing to feed different, different types of fats or fat supplements. Um, so when I'm talking fats here now, I'm talking about these commercially available uh, fat supplements, typically dry fat supplements, um, and different reasons. Obviously, to increase caloric intake, we all know fatty acids contain about two and a quarter times as much energy as carbohydrates and proteins. <clears throat> so hopefully you, you can, by feeding them, you can increase energy intake or certainly increase energy density of the ration. This may free up some space to make, some, make, make ration formulation more flexible. Um, hopefully you could also increase the yield of milk and milk components. Some people I hear use it to combat heat stress, maybe improve reproductive efficiency, it can impact or improve body condition score. And I think more and more now we're starting to better understand the potential role of specific fatty acids and specific types of fatty acid supplements can have impacts in different ways on some of these different areas. <clears throat> but I think the response is going to depend on the form of the fat. For example, is it a triglyceride or a free fatty acid or a calcium salt? Certainly, probably the most important one here, the fatty acid profile of, of any commercial fat supplement. Uh, the extent of unsaturation and or the carbon chain length. Uh, cow production level, you know, does a cow milk in a 120 pounds in milk respond the same as a cow milking 60 pounds in milk to a fat supplement? And I think also other dietary components can. So I think, and this is where some of our research in my lab's focused the last few years is if we can understand the effects of different types of fat supplements on production parameters, this is going to have direct impact on uh, dairy industry recommendations. So why, why are we hearing more and more people now looking to use, uh, or certainly a lot more interest in the potential use of uh, fat feeding? Um, obviously, as we go higher milk yields now across m most uh, dairy industries, there's a need to increase energy intake of that cow. There's increased use nowadays of high grain or speci specifically corn rations. And this often leads to milk fat depression, so potentially looking to pull out some of that grain. Um, Dr. Palmquist back in the 70s talked about this next one a lot about the potential for using fat supplementation and allowing the maximal use of. There's increasing availability of these dry supplemental fats nowadays. And as I've said earlier, this recognition that specific fatty acids may have beneficial effects as well. Now, of course, with anything, there are negatives here. And I think we need to be aware of them as well. Some fatty acids certainly may alter rumen biohydrogenation. Excuse me. So, for example, the more unsaturated fatty acids going into the rumen, the more detoxifying those rumen bacteria have to do. And if some of the other diet parameters might not be set up correct, we might run into some issues there with biohydrogenation. Some fatty acids may depress uh, feed intake. So you're not really in a winning situation if you increase the energy density of the ration, but then the cows eat less of that diet. You may not actually have any net, net improvement in energy. And certain fatty acids and fats may alter um, microbes or alter metabolism of the cow. And as we're starting to understand more now, individual fatty acids can have very different effects. Uh, some fat supplements, there's research out there, and I've kind of indicated some of this already, some fat supplements or indeed some specific fatty acids at increasing levels may be poorly digested. And an area we're becoming more interested in as well, what, what is the effect of the basal ration or other feed components have on the response to any given fat supplement? And then of course, cost. As a researcher, uh, mostly, doing, mostly working on the biology side here, but where um, all of you uh, can have a much uh, greater input, input onto this than I can is on the cost. Of course, nearly all fat supplements on a pound for pound basis are very expensive. So we need to consider that cost or I think more and more we probably need to think more about the marginal return of, on them rather than. Now, this is just some data out of my own lab over the last few years, just showing, giving you, providing this one as reference material as well. And I see really, you know, 
uh, three or four main types of uh, commercial uh, available fat supplements that are out there. There are still some um, areas, some people that, that still feed tallow. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about tallow today, other than we often, many people often think tallow is a saturated fat, uh, but the predominant uh, fatty acid in tallow is actually a lake acid that I just circled. And I think it's becoming more and more unsaturated with the uh, increasing use of distillers grains, for example, in the beef industry that provides a lot of the tallow. So I'm always uh, quite cautious when I see tallow um, in the diet if I'm trying to troubleshoot a milk fat depression situation, for example. Uh, in terms of dry commercially available fat sources, uh, probably the most common one that, that many of you see are what we could just uh, call calcium salts of palm fatty acids or palm fatty acid distillate, many different commercial uh, ones out there. You know, typically about 50% palmitic acid and about uh, 35 to 40% oleic acid. And then what I, I'm terming here, saturated free fatty acid supplements and the mixes. There's a, a number of commercial supplements out there that contain a mix of palmitic and stearic acid in somewhat varying proportions, typically greater in stearic acid. And then in the last few years, there's been a huge influx, certainly in the U.S. here, in the number of these palmitic acid-enriched fat supplements, where palmitic acid typically makes anywhere from 80 to 95% of the fatty acids in those supplements is simply palmitic acid. And we're going to talk about some of these. Uh, these and the individual fatty acids are highlighted here later. Um, a few years ago now, uh, Ian Lean's group in Australia uh, published a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is simply a, a fancy name given to collecting a lot of peer-reviewed research that's out there, um, individual studies, and putting them together to kind of give us what's the, the 30,000 uh, foot overview of, um, of this area. And this meta-analysis was on supplemental fat. <clears throat> and uh, looking specifically at a few fat supplements here. And their, their conclusions in general was that fat supplementation reduced dry matter intake, increased milk volume, reduced milk fat percent and milk protein percent, but increased fat yield but did not change protein yield, and therefore increased efficiency. That was their, their, their uh, conclusions there. <clears throat> So I think with that, I'm going to talk a little more about this poll, this uh, study in the next couple of slides after this, but I, I see we have time for a poll here now, so I'm going to hand it back. Okay, thank you. We'll do the last two polls. And we're bringing up poll three. You can, as soon as I open this, as, you, as soon as I open it, you can start answering, and not answering doesn't make this go faster. So <laughs> go ahead and feel free to answer. Um, what kind of fat do I recommend to supplement dairy diets? A, the cheapest, B, the most saturated, C, the most unsaturated, D, it depends on the diet, and E, I care only about the brand and I don't. We will go to our fourth poll. I do not recommend supplemental fat in dairy diets, A, because it is expensive, B, because I do not see a response, C, because it can depress, depress dry matter intake, D, because it can depress milk fat, and E, I do, not rec I do recommend supplemental fats in dairy diets. So this is a little bit of a trick question. We will revisit these poll questions at the end of the webinar. So now Adam will finish his presentation. All right. Thank you. I'm back. So, if you remember this last, uh, this meta-analysis here, this meta-analysis highlighted some of these general conclusions. But the big issue that, the, that it highlighted as well was that the effect on production response were, were varied greatly even within a fat supplement. And this is just shown, uh, just shown here in this meta-analysis here. If we look on the effects on milk fat yield, for example, here, the, these lines here, as I just highlight one here, for example, for talent, just highlights the wide variability in, in these responses. So we need to understand many of these different factors more going forward. Uh, the other 
Uh, the other challenge here with uh, this study, with the, with this uh, analysis here, was that the very limited number, for example, here of certain types of fat supplements, uh, prill fats here in this case, um, due to the use of only certain types of fat supplements here. So I had a, uh, a PhD student again, Jackie Borman, I mentioned earlier, um, uh, did her own meta-analysis in this area. Uh, we presented this at Dairy Science uh, last year. And our interest here was just focusing on the three common types of fat supplements, uh, the calcium salts of palm fatty acid distillate, the saturated fat prills. This is mostly um, the mixtures of palmitic and stearic acid in, in this analysis here. And then uh, studies that were labeled as uh, containing tallow in those studies. And as you can see here, we've got a much larger data set here, 130 here. Um, we've, now we have 30 uh, studies here that, that utilize the saturated uh, fat prills here. And then I'm just going to show a few slides from the results from this. Uh, this is typically here what you will see here, how meta-analyses are often showed, and uh, the Ian Lean study showed this as well. Um, what, this box here is the average response. And then, as I show, highlighted earlier, these lines here that I've just circled, that's the variation in that response. Now, that what I've just circled there is actually a, an average of the 56 different studies or a weighted average of the 56 studies. So, for example, all of those studies for the calcium salts of PFAD, the individual responses I, I've, just, I've, just shown, um, I've just shown here, and again, we can see that variation. <clears throat> But what we can see here is that on average, the calcium salts of palm fatty acid distillate and when, would, it, would reduce feed intake by half a kilogram a day. These are looking now at actual responses, not uh, weighted coefficients. Uh, no effect of the prills. No effect of prills on intake. Tallow had a similar nearly half a kilogram reduction in intake. The overall fat supplementation reduced uh, feed intake by about 0.3 kilograms a day. So similar overall um, results here that we're seeing from the previous. Again, very different on what type of milk yield. Overall, fat supplementation improved milk yield by about a kilogram a day. And it was very, fairly similar for calcium salt uh, fats and for prilled saturated fat supplements. About 1.2 uh, to 1.3 kilograms a day improvement in milk yield. Milk fat yield, now we start to see some differences coming out again. Overall, a slight improvement in fat yield. No effect of tallow supplementation on milk fat yield. And then a similar, actually a similar increase in milk fat yield across the two um, dry fat supplements here. Protein yield, very slight overall effect of protein, uh, of the fat supplementation on protein yield. No effect of calcium salts of PFAD, of palm fatty acids, on protein yield, and a small slight improvement with the saturated prills and tallow. So again, very similar overall results as from the from the other published uh, meta-analyses on this area. So uh, Jackie's uh, summary um, or conclusions here was that overall fat supplementation increased yield of milk and milk components and reduced feed intake. However, the type of fat significantly influenced. And we also here in this study tried to look at um, level of total fatty acid in the diet and NDF in the diet. But we really couldn't draw any firm conclusions on, on how total fat in the diet or NDF content of the diet may have impacted those responses. So again, pointing more and more to the type of individual fatty acids present in these different fat supplements, how they can impact the responses in terms of production and intake. I've been talking about all these different individual fatty acids and whether this is by saturation or chain length of the fatty acids. The one I'm, so I'm going to focus on here now is really on uh, palmitic acid here, stearic acid, and then our unsaturated fatty acids shown here. So if we go back to data um, from, um, from Scotland in the late 1960s here, we first started to see some of the um, differences in the impact of individual saturated fatty acids. And here we're looking at uh, maristic acid, palmitic, and stearic acid here across the milk fat percent on the top here, and then milk fat yield down here. And you can start to see 
that when palm, and stearic acid and palmitic acid was in, were included in the diet, there was an increase in milk fat yield, but palmitic acid increased milk fat yield more so than stearic acid. One thing you need to be aware of is uh, some of these shorter saturated chain fatty acids are actually quite toxic in the room and can have marked negative effects on uh, rumen bacteria. Lauric acid, for example, present in uh, coconut oil and uh, palm kernel oil uh, can have some very potent effects on milk components and on reducing feed intake as well. Um, so I think you know, I need to be aware where some of, where that fatty acid may be available in some sources. <clears throat> so this is where I first started getting interest in some of this area. Um, a few years ago now when people were starting to ask me about palmitic and stearic acid, and I started looking at some of that data from the 60s, and then a couple of studies <clears throat> coming out of France from Eng Engelbert's group here in 1998 and 2000. They did abomasal infusions, so they bypassed the rumen and abomasal infused 500 grams a day of either palmitic acid, 16-0, uh, stearic acid, 18-0, or oleic acid, 18-1. And you can see here, uh, as you put palmitic acid, in the diet, stearic acid and oleic acid in the diet, you've got increases in milk fat percentage. Um, milk yield goes up for palmitic acid and stearic acid. Interestingly, with the infusion of 500 grams of oleic acid, milk production drops below control, and that's because of the uh, potent negative effect it had on uh, dry matter intake, which dropped as well. But when I, ca when I calculated that milk fatty acid yield, you can see that palmitic acid here and stearic acid both increased uh, fat yield, milk fat yield, but the increase was greater for palmitic acid than it was stearic acid, very similar again to that data from the 1960s. What they also showed in this study is that they did some AV, arterial venous differences across the mammary gland, and they showed that mammary uptake and extraction efficiency by the mammary gland was higher for palmitic acid than it was for stearic acid, which is uh, very interesting. <clears throat> Now, there's some mechanistic support here from uh, Hansen and Hudson in 1987. I don't want to get into the specifics of this in vitro uh, data. But what they simply showed here uh, in the, on the left-hand side here was that palmitic acid stimulated de novo synthesis, so the short, medium chain fatty acids, and incorporation of those fatty acids into triglycerides, into milk fat, whereas other fatty acids were either neutral or inhibitory. Um, so in blue here is uh, palmitic acid, in red is oleic acid here, and then in green here is stearic acid. And uh, shown over here on the on the second figure here is that they showed that only minor, there are only minor differences in their esterification efficiency. So the um, combining of the fatty acid to glycerol to make milk fat into the triglyceride of various fatty acids, except for palmitic acid, which was this is taking uh, quotes directly from their paper except for palmitic acid, which was a clearly better substrate than the other fatty acids. So we've got some infusion data in dairy cows and some in vitro data here showing that maybe there are some differences by how some of these fatty acids impact milk fat yield. <clears throat> this is where some of the, I um, want to show a few uh, slides here from some of the research carried out recently at Michigan State University. The first couple of slides here from a recent graduate of MSU here, Paola Piantoni, a uh, PhD student uh, now working, uh, uh, sorry, PhD student of Mike Allen's, who's uh, now working um, in Europe. Um, some of you on, on the call here may, may know Paola, she's, she's from Argentina. So we carried out a serious study, uh, Mike Allen and I, um, looking at pure, in, uh, pure fatty acid supplements, so palmitic acid and stearic acid, um, and looking at the effects that they had on uh, milk production parameters across a wide range of production levels. <clears throat> So this was a 99% uh, pure uh, palmitic acid supplement fed at 2% of diet dry matter, um, fed in a simple crossover design study. But we saw that palmitic acid, when included in the diet, increased milk yield, increased milk fat yield, increased, as you would expect, then fat corrected milk, improved uh, um, feed conversion or feed efficiency, simply fat corrected milk over intake but had no effect on protein and lactose. Now, one of the interests here, we used um, uh, Mike Allen's uh, model that he's used for a number of years now, and asked, also asked the question here, well, did cows 
vary in their response to palmitic acid, whether they were low, medium, or high producing dairy cows. So I think that's an important commercial um, question to answer. And if you're looking to include such a fat supplement, you know, can it be that, can you see a production response in, in cows just in certain levels of milk production or across a much wider range? And in this study, uh, Paola had cows starting the study, here just on the x-axis, preliminary milk yield, anywhere from about 30 kilograms, so what, 60, 60, 70 pounds in milk, all the way up to 65 kilograms, 100, 140, 150 pounds in milk. And what, what's important to take home here is that when supplementing palmitic acid, results were independent of level of milk production. So it didn't matter what level of milk production, in terms of fat yield here, the response was greater when palmitic acid was in the diet. We carried out exactly the same study design um, using a 98% pure stearic acid supplement now. So the first study of palmitic acid. Now this is stearic acid. Paola published this study now at just earlier on this year. <clears throat> Again, at 2% of the diet dry matter, we saw that stearic acid increased intake, increased feed intake, and increased the yield of milk and milk components. Now, in this study, we did see a very interesting relationship between preliminary milk yield and the response to um, supplemental stearic acid. And it was only in the higher yielding cows responded more positively to stearic acid than lower yielding cows. So at these, at these lower levels here, we really saw no, no effect of adding the stearic acid to the diet. And it was only up at this, this higher range that we started to see some differences in milk yield and milk components. So a very important consideration there, I think, when choosing type of fat supplements. Now, of course, both of these studies I've just shown you from Paola uh, compared a non-fat supplemented control diet to the addition of 2% either palmitic or stearic acid. And in both of these studies, we took 2% soy holes out of the diet to make room for the stearic acid or the palmitic acid. So the obvious follow-up study to that was to do a direct comparison between palmitic acid and stearic acid. <clears throat> and this is shown here. This study is published last year by a, a master student in my lab, Eduardo Rico, um, now doing a PhD at uh, West Virginia. So again, 2% of diet dry matter, but this time the diets are isochloric as well because we just simply compared one fat supplement to the other fat supplement, comparing palmitic to stearic acid. So interestingly, palmitic acid supplementation compared to stearic acid, again, increased milk fat yield, increased fat corrected milk and improved uh, feed conversion efficiency. So with similar levels of response here to palmitic acid when compared to stearic acid, similar to what we also saw when we just simply compared it to soy holes in the diet. And again, in this case for palmitic acid, responses were independent of level of milk production. So we still saw that response to palmitic acid across the wide ranges of milk production compared to soy holes in the first study I showed, and also compared to stearic acid here in this study. So again, we can see these differences here in, in fat percent and in fat yield here. <clears throat> so I find that interesting that we saw a similar nearly 100 gram increase in fat yield um, in this study, uh, where we also fed a, the same amount of a different fatty acid compared to when we um, had more fatty acids in the diet when we simply compared the part. So all of those studies were fed at 2% uh, diet dry matter, which I realize is at a very high level, and really not one that would not be fed at a commercial, um, in a commercial situation. So the next study we did, again, was another part of Eduardo Rico's uh, master's work, was to do a dose response with, in this case, this was about an 85% uh, commercially available palmitic acid supplement. <clears throat> here we are, sorry, this is it here. Uh, so in, in this study of Eduardo's, we fed uh, four levels of palmitic acid a supplement in the diet, as I said, an 85% commercially available palmitic supplement, either at 0 0.75, 1.5, or 2.5% uh, dry matter. So as we go along the x-axis here and here, this is increasing level of palmitic acid inclusion in the diet. And as you can see here, we see improvement in milk fat percent and in milk fat yield here. Well, what's interesting is we see the maximum response in fat yield, oops, sorry, um, with the 1.5% inclusion in the diet, much greater than what we saw at the 2.25 level um, 
in the diet. So that's kind of where I'm recommending <clears throat> in terms of inclusion levels now. Right now, I certainly won't go any higher than 1.5% dry matter in the diet. Um, not shown here, we actually fed this against, in the background, the two different levels of basal fatty acids in the diet. And in both cases, um, this 1.5% one, 1 inclusion of the palmitic acid and rich fat supplement gave us our maximum response in terms of uh, milk fat yield. Interesting here, when we go to the digestibility data, and this is, a, um, this is based off that same study, but we reported this at dairy science, um, at the dairy science animal science meetings earlier on this year in Florida. You now look at the digestibility data. <clears throat> One of the reasons... Uh, we start to see some very inter interesting interactions here now between the level of fat palmitic acid supplementation in the diet and the effects that that has on digestibility, whether it's fed in a low-fat diet or in a high-fat diet. And actually, we get less reduction in fatty acid digestibility in the, the high-fat diet than what we did in the low-fat diet. And I'm just showing you this here now simply because <clears throat> I think this is an area we need to explore further. Um, I'm, I'm showing quite a bit of data right now on the palmitic acid side of the story, and I think there's a lot of opportunities there. But I think in the future, as we go forward, we're going to be looking at some of these other fatty acids and what can we do to maybe provide the ideal or the best profile of fatty acids available to the dairy cow, whether that's for, for improving fatty acid digestibility. As you can see, some big differences here in fatty acid digestibility. Maybe ideal profile of fatty acids to help maximize milk fat responses, or maybe um, body weight gains or energy partitioning within the cow. And of course, more and more interest now in terms of uh, reproduction and animal health as well. So I just showed you the data on uh, responses to palmitic acid uh, supplementation in a dose response. Uh, Jackie Borman at last year's dairy science meetings presented an abstract uh, a similar abstract now, but looking at stearic acid uh, supplementation in a dose response going anywhere from zero up to two, two and a half percent uh, diet dry matter. And, uh, if you just look at the summary down here, stearic acid supplementation increased feed intake, so similar to what we saw in uh, Paola's previous study, but had no effect on yields of milk or milk components. You can see here, no significant effects across any of these common production parameters. And you see these are uh, mid, you know, lower to mid producing dairy cows here now. So anywhere up to about 80, 90 pounds in milk. Even though we had a wide range of supplementation of stearic acid here, we saw no improvements in milk production, unlike what we did with um, palmitic acid, as I showed in the previous uh, dose response by Eduardo Rico. One of the one of the things we think maybe the maybe the reason here is when we looked at digestibility as we increased um, as we increased the dose of uh, stearic acid here, we saw a, a marked drop off in fatty acid digestibility as shown here. So here on the x axis we have total fatty acid intake, and of course because we're supplementing stearic acid here, most of this increase in total fatty acid intake is stearic acid and look at the marked drop-off we have in fatty acid digestibility. So, and this actually, this um, slope we see here is actually very similar to what we, I showed you in that meta-analysis in the first part here when we looked at, pure, at just studies that had intestinal uh, flows of stearic acid. It's interesting that we see very similar um, responses here in terms of the, the slope that we see with, 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 this, with this line here. So more and more stearic acid in the diet, more stearic acid coming out of the rumen. We seem to have a very large drop off here in the fatty acid digestibility. And that's just shown here, just um, summarizing those three studies. Here's the meta-analysis here, um, just marked over here with the X, and that I showed from earlier on that's going to be, public, that's going to be available online soon. As duodenal flow of stearic acid increases, you see this marked drop off in digestibility of stearic acid. The study I just shown here in the in the middle here, marked with the with the Y. Uh, this is just the data I just showed as if, as we increased uh, stearic acid supplementation in our dose response. We see a large drop off in total fatty acid digestibility. And then here, just marked here on the right, the Z here. This is the palmitic acid dose response with increasing 
fatty acid intake. We certainly don't see such a marked drop off in digest total fatty acid digestibility here compared to what we see with the with the middle figure here. Now remember, but important that these these two here, these two figures here. This is looking at total trapped fatty acid digestibility as opposed to the first one here that has the duodenal flow and intestinal digestibility. I think the, uh, this is an area we need to, to look at more in the future and is there a way that we can maybe reduce some of this uh, reduction in stearic acid digestibility, uh, maybe through matching it up with some other fatty acids. Talking about some of the unsaturated fatty acids, um, and as we've talked about, maybe we can potentially run into some issues with, uh, uh, with milk fat depression. Um, but I think that's some things we need to, uh, to consider going forward. And here's a nice study from Lou Armentano <clears throat> at University of Wisconsin, where uh, through different oil supplements, he fed three different diets that were either low, medium, or, or high in a layer acid. This is just using different vegetable oils. So they're not calcium salt products and they're not protected supplements. He just fed different blends of vegetable oils to get a high, low, and medium oleic acid in blue or a, or a low, medium, or high level of linoleic acid in the diet. As you can see, in terms of milk fat depression, reduction in milk fat yield, this is milk fat yield here on the, on the y-axis. You see a reduction in, <clears throat> for both oleic and linoleic, but the reduction was much more for linoleic than it was for oleic acid. So when you're looking to maybe try and troubleshoot some of these situations, like linoleic is the first to look at, but um, I still think it's important to look at that um, uh, all fatty acid in the diet, and that's where we came up with that concept of uh, rueful, rheum and unsaturated fatty acid load. But be aware that we can have some differences between oleic acid um, versus linoleic acid as well. And then just a, a few comments here on some different interactions here, fat forage interactions. This is from uh, early lactation cows from feeding a mixture of palmitic and stearic acid in a saturated fat prill here from 21 days out to, I think, about 100 days in milk. In the high forage diet, um, as shown here on, on the left, um, the increased energy from the, this supplemental fat and was directed mostly to body reserves. But in the low forage diet, shown here on the right, uh, the increased energy intake was directly directed mostly to milk production. So depending on what your what what your goal is here, you can have very different effects on energy partitioning in in these cows that are coming up into peak. And, and now Paola P and Tony and, and Mike Allen, a PhD student with Mike Allen. Uh, just published uh, a series of two studies in Journal of Dairy Science where they fed the same commercial, commercially available uh, saturated prill supplement containing a mixture of palmitic and, and stearic acid and fed it for 21 days, oh, sorry, for, um, for 28 days from calving through, through the first, first few weeks of, of lactation and then followed those cows out afterwards. And again, they saw some interesting interactions that this mixture of palmitic and stearic acid uh, just simply here um, actually ended up in the solid lines here with lower milk production across two different forage MDFs. Um, and that was associated with an improvement, as you can quite imagine, in energy balance and in body condition score. So in, with this, this being a mixture of palmitic and stearic acid, there's certainly some different partitioning effects on whether that dietary energy was going towards milk production or maintenance of, of body reserves in this early lactation period. But uh, importantly, some very big differences here in, uh, in peak milk production. So again, I'm not saying which is the, the, the best here or right or wrong, but uh, some different considerations have to be made here. Uh, the, the one gap we have in our in my own uh, uh, in our own research on palmitic acid, we've done obviously done quite a few studies now with palmitic acid and these mixtures of palmitic and stearic. But with palmitic acid, I know of no research studies that have fed palmitic acid from from calving on, looking at energy balance. And would you see similar or or different effects compared to this if you fed a, a very uh, a rich source of palmitic acid versus a mixture of palmitic and stearic? And that's a Certainly a study I'd like to do in the near future. Now, so this does lead to this effect on partitioning, and I think that's something we need to, need to consider. Uh, this is a study from uh, Kevin Harvatine at Penn State now when he was a master's student with Mike Allen. 
uh, looked at feeding a saturated uh, a mix of palmitic and stearic or a calcium salt of soy fatty acids over here, um, and then a 50-50 mix of these two here. And basically what they saw here is as you, you got reductions in uh, milk fat production and in milk yield here, you got a repartitioning of that energy to body weight gain. So we, people have talked about this for a long time, but it's something we've been interested in following up more in the future. When you reduce milk energy output and the easiest way that milk energy output typically is, um, is reduced is because of milk fat depression, that energy has to go somewhere and it typically goes into body weight and you see these dramatic differences in body weight in this study. Here. So really milk fat depression, and so just trying, trying, trying to tie some of these areas together, milk fat depression is actually a repartitioning of energy. So when you get reduced milk fat synthesis, obviously milk fat is the most energy dense component in milk, so less milk fat, less milk energy you actually see a repartitioning of that. And uh, we looked at this in a study that's now available online. This is, again, one of Jackie Borman's PhD studies, where we looked at the effects of replacing dietary starch with fiber and fat in the diet on milk production and energy partitioning. Uh, so we simply had a high fiber and fat diet, and the fat in this diet was 2.5% uh, palmitic acid enriched uh, fat supplement, a commercially available fat supplement. And so this, this diet was at down at about 16% starch, and our high starch diet was up at 32% starch. So as you can imagine, we got more fat, milk fat yield here. We, we lost a bit of protein yield, yield here. Um, energy corrected milk was fairly similar. Um, dry matter intake was not, was not a hu hugely different. <clears throat> but then energy corrected milk um, over dry matter intake was a bit slightly improved for the high fiber and fat diet. I think what is important to note here, and one of the often a criticism of maybe going to a lower starch or, or a lower starch diet is, is for mid and late lactation cows is that you're going to lose milk production. We really didn't lose milk production in these cows, certainly when we. But what's interesting here is when we look at the partitioning side of this story, on the high fiber and fat diet, nearly 73% of that dietary energy was going to milk. And only four was going to body weight gain, 4% of that dietary energy. Whereas about 68% of that dietary energy was going to milk in the high starch diet, but 10% of it was going to dietary, um, was going to body weight gain. And you can see that in terms of change in body weight. These are 28 day periods, so longer periods than what we typically feed in some of our studies. But you can see here that change in body weight was 0.3 kilograms per day the high fiber and fat diet, but nearly 0.8 kilograms per day for the high starch diet. So there was no change, no gain or loss in body condition score here, but a quarter unit of body condition score on that high starch diet, even though dietary energy intake was pretty much the same where that energy was being, re was being partitioned, whether it's between milk synthesis, milk energy, or into body weight gain, can be very different. And I think this is a we need to look at more in the future here now with um, maybe fat supplementation and lower starch, higher higher um, forager or higher NDF, but from byproduct feeding diets, and this, uh, how we can maybe partition more and more energy towards weight gain, um, sorry, towards milk gain and avoiding excessive weight gain in mid and late lactation cows. So Jackie concluded here, the higher fiber and fat diet uh, may diminish the incidence of over-conditioning in mid and late. So just to conclude here, you know, I think uh, energy is an important reason why we feed supplemental fat, um, because that higher energy, uh, energy content in fatty acids than there is in, in uh, carbohydrates and protein. But we need, in, so there are these caloric effects and caloric implications, but we're starting to understand more and more now what, I'm, what I perhaps term here these non-caloric effects. So the effects that individual fatty acids may have on biological responses, whether it's in the rumen, in the, in the small intestine, or in, in, in the mammary gland, or in, even in adipose tissue. So we need to consider the effects of different fatty acids on the yield of milk and milk components, maintenance of body condition, nutrient partitioning, uh, reproduction, and health. And in, in this uh, webinar, I've not had time to talk about some of the potential for omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids in some of these. But I would say, it probably is one of my main take-homes from tonight here, is that the fatty acid profile of any fat supplement that you're considering 
will most likely be the first factor in, in determining the response to that supplemental fat. And I think that need, needs to be the first consideration here. What, so I think we've gone in the days when people just say, oh, I have a fat supplement or supplemental fat in my diet. You need to know what, what type of fat supplement it is and really specifically what type of fatty acids in that fat supplement. This is just a little model that uh, we drew, um, <clears throat> my group here drew, just to try and capture some of these different things. We, as I said earlier, we've got all these different fatty acids. Remember, it's really these six fatty acids, these five fatty acids here, sorry, and the main ones you're typically going to see in the, dairy, in the diet of a dairy cow. Um, palmitic, stearic, oleic, linoleic, and linolenic acid. They're the main ones we're going to be looking at. And they can all potentially have different effects in the rumen, in the small intestine, in the mammary gland, and then on, on effects on body weight gain and adipose tissue. And we need to try and weigh up some, some of these different. So I think meta-analyses, our own and from other people, reveal overall benefits of fat supplementation um, on the yield of milk and milk fat with a reduction in intake. But not all fat sources are the same. Know what fatty acids are in the supplement you are using. Uh, the chain length and degree of unsaturation are key. You need to consider the important effects of different fatty acids on biohydrogenation in the rumen, and that obviously the knock on that's going to have on milk fat depression here. In the small intestine, <clears throat> whether that be on feed intake or on digestibility, I showed you some uh, newer data on fatty acid digestibility tonight, and then in the mammary gland as well. Research is clearly needed to establish the effects of these different fatty acids at different stages of lactation and then their interaction with different diets. And I just started to show a little there on some of this uh, potential maybe for feeding specific fatty acids in uh, mid and late lactation cows to maximize uh, milk energy, minimize body weight gain. And of course, I showed here in, in terms of the effects on the mammary gland, some of our work here uh, with palmitic acid and stearic acid and the effects that they may have on. Um, production of milk components in the mammary gland. Now, of course, the economics and the marginal return should also always be continually evaluated and, cons and considered, and that's obviously going to change on a day-to-day -day basis, and you guys um, are going to be um, in the forefront or at the driving seat of making those decisions. Um, just a little plug here at the end, I actually have a dairy nutrition, uh, uh, MSU Dairy Nutrition Facebook page here. If anyone's interested, I, I post some of our stuff on the on the dairy cow side here, but I also um, post a lot of different information on there about milk and human health. One of my other interests, particularly the increasing number of uh, positive articles and information that's coming out about milk, fat, and human health now. So with that, I think I'll hand back. Anyone has any questions or comments? Here's my uh, uh, email address here, and the, I just. This is, my, this is my two boys uh, when we were back in England at Hadrian's Wall earlier on this summer. Um, again, I have a, um, my uh, website there and the, and the Facebook page. So I'm looking forward to the discussions. Hope I saved enough time for them. And uh, feel free to uh, email any further questions and comments as we go through. So I think I'll pass that back to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Locke. That was a really good presentation. We'll take care of a few administrative details. And then we'll start with the question and answer period. I want to remind our listeners to attend the next webinar to be held on the 14th of October at 6 p.m. UTC minus 4 or Eastern Daylight Time. Our next speaker, speaker will be Dr. John Gazer, Ph.D., who received his Ph.D. from the University of Wisconsin, where his fo focus was on carbohydrate digestion and metabolism. He currently serves as Rock River Laboratory's Director of Nutritional Research and Innovation, where he assists nutritionists and consultants in using knowledge and analysis results to resolve challenges in the field. Additionally, he serves as an adjunct professor at UW-Madison. His talk will focus on using feed analysis results to improve farm performance. Save the date and time, Wednesday, October 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We want to take a minute. Our sponsors in the English language seminar, we have Tom Taluki, AMTS USA and Global, Marcelo Hens Ramos at 3R Lab Brazil, 
Paula Torillo in Argentina are translators at each location. They always have the hardest job. We also want to thank um, the sponsors, Ajimoto Heartland Incorporator, makers of Agipro L, Protected Lysine, and Virtus Energy 2, Prequel, and Strata. Archived presentations are available at our website. We will start first with a few questions and answer questions. After a few, we'll take a break from audience questions to present the poll results. Marcelo and Paula will translate and moderate questions from Brazil and Argentina, respectively. For our listeners in the English language webinar, unless you're certain your audio is working properly, I ask that you type your questions in the question and answer window, and I'll read the question and identify the questioner. So for this, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Dr. Locke in case he needs to reference any of his slides. And I would like to first unmute Paula and Marcelo so that they can thank Dr. Locke for his presentation as well. Paula and Marcelo, you should be unmuted. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm here. Excellent. Excellent. Paula, do you have any questions from Argentina? Yes, we have questions. First of all, I have a, a question from uh, Eduardo. He's uh, from Uruguay. Okay. Uh, regarding the use of ingredients uh, such as uh, high-fat high ingredients as the healer soybean expeller combined with spring pastures, low-effective NDF, is there any additive we could use to improve biohydrogenation in women? Um, that's a good yeah. question. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, are there some modifiers that we can use to help maintain normal biohydrogenation? That, that, there's individual studies pointing to a number of different um, things there. I mean, there is some work. Uh, so I would say, I, in my opinion, the number one driver of alternative biohydrogenation pathways so what pushes biohydrogenation down the pathways that cause milk fat depression? I think the number one biggest issue is low rumen pH or reduced rumen pH. We've done a series of studies lately in, in vitro where we've just uh, cultured bacteria in either 6.2 or 5.8 pH cultures. And we can see huge shifts towards the, the trans 10 CLA at that 5.8. So shifts in, bi in pH are a big driver of biohydrogenation. You certainly, we're not talking acidosis situation, um, but I'm saying that to, to indicate, I think anything that you can do in those situations, as your questioner mentioned, to help improve room and pH is going to help potentially maintain normal biohydrogenation. So for example, we, we had in abstract of dairy science this year in, in Florida at the dairy animal science meeting where we fed cows a, um, a culture product, a Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, fermentation product, and then looked in vitro at biohydrogenation. And those cows that were fed the yeast, yeast sub culture supplement were able to maintain normal biohydrogenation pathways better than those that did not have it contained. Um, there's some data out there um, that's talked about potassium carbonate. Um, I think the most recent data I've shown on that is more as it's the carbonate effect um, that's helping with buffering capacity. Yeah, so, you know, potential for room and buffers. Now, of course, the, probably the most effective room and buffer is getting some more effective fiber in the cow to help try and buffer that. Um, but in terms of other components, there's some limited data potentially on molasses or some sugars re replacing carbohydrate, um, re replacing starch in the diet may have some effect as well. But um, again, just limited studies here or there, but doing whatever you can to help either pull out some of the unsaturated fat in those situations and or probably at the same time trying to improve uh, raise room and pH and maintain better room and buffering. I think that's what's going to help there. Sorry, that was a very long answer. That's okay. Paula, do you have another Perfect. question? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, from Carlos, they, they found uh, higher values of total fat in diets 
These are partial t uh, partial uh, mixed rations. Okay. I I, I mean uh, cows are grazing and then it's in a concentrate with corn silage, uh, uh, ground corn and dry ground ground corn, uh, soy high pro. Okay. So the actual diet's coming back at a higher fat content than what the model's predicting. I think that was the question. I think the first they they found that value at at the laboratory. Mm hmm So the question is is what what's driving I think what ingredient or what ingredients are causing those higher fat contents? Um I think if they if they can correct that uh, because they are having low peaks also. Okay, I see. Yeah, I, I think you all you always want to have a good knowledge or an accurate what you what you're predicting what you're formulating the diet for should should match what the actual cows are seeing as much much as you can or vice versa. So what what are the reasons why that those cows are, that diet is higher in fat or in or lower in fat and try it and try and sort of capture that. I mean, in that sort of situation, it might be changes in the pasture um, quality um, as, as, as you go through time. But I'd also always look at those um, byproduct feeds in the diet as well. Um, I mean, byproducts can be a very good, can be very well utilized in the diet, but you have to know very well what you have there. And that's where I think the feed labs can come in and really help, especially if we can get rapid turnaround NIR analysis on some of this total fat content that would give it because there's no point a farm that's getting through a, a load of distillers or other byproduct at once a week or every other week sending something to a lab like my own which takes so long to do wet chemistry you need these rapid turnarounds so I'm not sure I've really fully answered that question but um, tell the questioner feel free to email me as well if wants further follow-up Perfect. I will ask him if it's uh, if it's been answered. Uh, Marcelo, do you have any questions? Oh yeah, we have a lot of questions here. I'm trying okay. to summarize. Such a great webinar. Uh, where do I start here? Uh, a little bit on the maybe on the why. Why uh, insaturated fat will depress? Uh, more the dry matter intake and maybe the saturated fat will depress less or is that uh, can you discuss a little bit uh, on that? So I mean th there's a number of studies that have looked at that Chris Reynolds at Ohio State had some research on that Mike Allen as well um, unsaturated fatty acids seem to have more an effect on some of the gut peptides in the small intestine that feed back on the on, on feed intake um, so I think the more unsaturated fatty acids, the more potential you have for lowering feed intake in those situations because biohydrogenation is never 100% complete. You know, typically we think biohydrogenation anywhere from 80 to 90, 95% biohydrogenation. Whether that's coming from fatty acids in a forage or even within a, within a commercial fat supplement. Um, but the more oleic or the more linoleic you feed, you are going to get a small amounts more of those reaching the small intestine. And in some situations, that may signal for lower intake. But that may also slightly improve fatty acid digestibility, and that's something else we're following up on. But it's the gut peptides, I think, that's having the effects on the intake differences you talk about there, Marcelo. Okay, thanks. Marcelo, if you'd like to continue with questions, that'd be yeah. great. Maybe on the summary, uh, would the unsaturated fat would go more to the carcass and saturated fat would go more toward the milk? Is that a, is a good summary? That's kind of where we're thinking somewhat now. Um, I, what I would ask whoever asked that question is, and, and where I'm thinking more, we, we, sh we need to go more in depth than just saying unsaturates versus saturates. Because as I, hopefully I showed today, there's big differences just in the saturates of yeah. parmitic and stearic acid. Certainly parmitic acid, I think, is going more and more to the mammary gland um, in terms of making more milk fat. 
typically we see about 20 to 25 percent transfer of palmitic acid we, that we feed in the supplement goes into making more milk fat. So it's not an all or nothing, but we're, also, we're always going to get a bit more milk energy that way, I think. Where the unsaturates, so maybe a leg or linoleic, I think they, I, I would agree, I think they can partition more energy to body weight. That's going to be most pronounced if we maybe have a lower milk fat yield, so le less milk energy. So yeah, I would agree with that, but that's something I think we need to get dig more into. And can we potentially use those different substances and strategies for depending on what any given uh, farm or group of cows' goal is? I think that's where we can maybe go further in the future, Master. So that's the, I'm glad you picked that up. I thank you. Okay, Marcelo, can we have a couple questions from Paula and then we'll um, come back to you? Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Paula. Okay. Uh, Dr. Locke, I have a comment about last question uh, of Carlos. Uh, he is saying that uh, he found 8% per, eight of total fat in rye grass. Yes. I mean, that's total fat, so that's probably E for extract, so, that's, uh, that's, so there's not so much total fatty acid in there. But I think in fresh young grass, I mean, I think I showed from Europe earlier on and that data, they were up to about 7% fatty acids. I think it was 6.8% fatty acids. So that could be anywhere, maybe even up to 8 or 9% E for extract, maybe higher in, the, in, in that pasture. So I think that the younger the growth, the lusher the pasture, the higher the fatty acid content. So yeah, I, I can see that certainly being possible. Okay, thank you. And another question from Leonardo Burdizzo. Uh, which was uh, the body condition score evolution with static acid supplementation? Mm -hmm. In the, when we did the dose response with steric, we really didn't see much on body condition score, which you would maybe expect because in those mid-lactation mid cows, the more steric acid we gave them, they did not produce more milk or milk fat. But the digestibility in that study, was there was a big drop off the more steric acid we fed in fatty acid digestibility. So. They weren't. They were getting proportionally some more energy, but not huge, huge amounts more energy. Um, now, in the early lactation study that Paola P and Tony did, clearly there were some partitioning differences there between feeding the palmitic and stearic acid mix versus not not feeding it. And when and when it was fed, there was less milk output, but obviously then there was less loss of body condition. Um, I don't know what that would be for if we fed a pure ste a steric, uh, a palmitic acid right now, um, but in certainly in established lactation cows, post peak cows, given some of our results of late, I probably would not be using a steric acid in in, in a fat supplement because we probably want to maximise milk production, efficient milk production. And most of the time, we, we do not want to be putting excessive amount of body weight back on those cows. We want to get them back to a target and then maintain them. And I think that's maybe going to some of these lower starts. Some fat in may help us maintain body condition in some of these mid and late lactation. We do have more questions from Brazil, but at this time, we'll cover the poll results. All right, Marcelo and Dr. Locke, if you two would like to discuss the poll results, that would be fantastic. Thanks. Uh, in the blue, you see U.S. people, in yellow, Brazil, and in the green, you see Argentina. This, the point of this question is just to show a lot of times we do have difference between the formulate diet and the diet that's in front of the cows in terms of total fat and individual fat, like you pointed earlier in your presentation. Uh, I'm very glad I'm a little bit sad on the, on the answer A that, that uh, we have a decent amount of people in the United States and Brazil that believe that you have exactly 5% fat on the diet. Uh, uh, we have not been very lucky on that uh, in the lab, but there is a difference. I don't know if you want to comment on that uh, question A. Yeah, I think 
<clears throat> the key here is where I think where we need to go in the future is that we we would never just I think I said this earlier we would never just accept NDF or starch or crude protein values on a on a forage for example or on some of these byproducts. Um, we would always send that, send those ingredients away to get some, to get some chemistry on them. Um, so certainly for some of some of those feeds, maybe we should do that more and more. Um, for fat total fatty acid content, from our work, we've not seen big differences in profile within any within a given fat type of feed. Obviously, across feeds, there's different profile, but within. It's really the total fat, fatty acid that's varying the most. And I like the question, the answer is C, uh, because we do realize forage, and sometimes we don't realize, but we should, that forage, do, do, they do contribute a lot uh, with the fat acid. Yeah. And uh, it depends on what you have. You will have a lot of variation in the fat acid, and on the profile of the fat acid between the diet. So the answer is C, I like that, that, that the answer there. And that was borne out by that question from Argentina earlier on. Yes, and of course the management will display a lot, but uh, if we go back to answer B, it's going to vary from four to six. That's a lot of times we, we want that to happen, you know, when you formulate for, for starch at 25%, you want to believe it's 23 to 27 or NDF 32, and I believe it's 30 to 35, but it does it does have a decent amount of variation that can cause uh, a lot of things that you discussed in your presentation. Yeah, and of course, you know, a, a couple percentage units different in fatty acids can have a big impact on the amount of yes. linoleic acid, for example, going into that diet. If yes, you can account exactly. for it, I think you can, like if you, let's say you had a higher feed, it's higher fatty acid feed ingredient, but if you know it's a higher fatty acid ingredient, on any given time, you can probably make some allowances to help feed your way through it. It's when you don't, it's what you don't know is what, what hurt, hurts you the most of it. Well, let's see. Brazilians are recommending to improve efficiency uh, for the most part. Americans and Americans and Argentinians are recommending fat to improve body condition score, which I have a couple questions. I do have, we have but maybe 20% of the Argentinian people that do not recommend. And uh, they're mixed here on it to increase the milk, it to increase solids, which I would uh, would expect and a lot of people from Brazil at least uh, to improve, it to increase milk and solids. But yeah, they're in, in, recommending more to improve efficiency. Interesting. Yeah, interesting, interesting. You know, and I, I really hope one of my take homes from today is that we need to just, I mean, as I said earlier, we need to move away from just talking about a fat supplement. I have a fat supplement in the diet. It's really yeah. specific types of fatty acids within that supplemental fat. For so more than almost a half, 50% of the Americans and Argentines are recommending to improve uh, body condition score. That, that's interesting. I never, we never, we barely discuss about that. We always, um, maybe, like at least we, Around me, the well, I was talking about fat between solids and milk. Yeah. But uh, that's uh, that's good to know. Well, I think certainly in uh, in the early lactation cow, I mean, especially with some of these um, the commercial supplements that are a mix of palmitic and spheric, they have they have some, as I showed from Paula earlier, they have some data there to, to support some some of that. Um, whereas I'm also sort of going the other way now is. I think you could also potentially use certain fat supplements to you know, establish lactation in mid and late lactation to help maintain any given body condition score and to, and to avoid over conditioning. Mm -hmm. Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly in, the, in the US, especially with the BST, um, recombinant BST no longer being an option in many markets. You know, these these uh, herds on very wandering uh, TMR diets have, have typically struggled with getting too fat in, in lactation, in, in later lactation. So can we use higher fiber and fat diets to, um, to stop that excess gain? In, uh, in reduced starch? Yes. Okay. Which can be used for other, either reduce starch or shift which diets that that starch is being fed in. 
to help maybe with peak milk production. Okay. Uh, what kind of fat I recommend? Most Brazilians are between more saturated. I have seen that a lot. And uh, let's say Americans, uh, maybe 50 percent of them are. It depends on the diet, which is a good question. It's a smart question, in my opinion. I don't like 20 percent of the Americans telling about uh, the cheapest one. Uh, I personally don't never go to the cheapest or anything. Uh, there is a strong power of marketing here, and depends on the brand. So we do know that a lot of people they don't know what kind of fat it is. They just trust the company. And you see in Brazil and Argentina, they're recommending more unsaturated, but Americans are not. Can you maybe discuss that a little bit of difference? Why? Or maybe you're surprised that Americans are not recommending unsaturated anymore, or maybe a little bit unsaturated? Um, I mean, I don't no. have a specific answer for that. I mean, some of it may be availability. Um, there's certainly a lot of data out of the U.S. on um, the palmitic stearic acid blends for for the last 20 years now and the last few years you know some research from our lab and from other labs looking at some of these palmitic acid supplements so availability you know availability to some of the more some of the research perhaps um, but that could also maybe come down to cost as well you know if you're using some more tallow based products or something like that or or some of the cows themselves are palm distillate, which are more unsaturated. I know in some of South America, there's some more of these cows themselves are soybean, soy oil as well, um, which um, maybe they're, they're more available or more well-known. Um, but again, you have to be careful there with some of the excess unsaturated fats you're bringing into the diet. Yes. Okay, I'll go to the last one, and I just want to caution you. I know that I make the error of saying in the U.S., but we really have a pretty international attendance in the oh. English language one. So some of these answers might not be coming solely from the U.S. All right, we'll go to the last okay. discussion slide. I do not recommend fat for cattle, but most of them which is very interesting, do recommend uh, most of the Brazilian, most of the Americans, but Argentinians are still on the fence, uh, or Spanish people uh, like Mary and Point right now, because, do it, and I think you show some of the research showing it depressed a little bit, some of them in fat, maybe some of them more in saturated depressing dry melon date. It difficult sometimes people uh, just the response at the farm, so they do have to believe on the data. And I think the most uh, response that we see at the field is the expense. And I think you point out very well that you have to see the, the return over the cost. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to, you know, if you're paying a lot of money for a supplement like that, but and maybe you're not seeing a milk production response, um, that, that can be a challenge, but then some people are using it more for a body condition effect. So it's hard. Sometimes I wonder, well, what price do you put on maintaining that body condition versus, yeah. versus other things? Um, so that's where, like what you said earlier on, Marcelo, this may be different fatty acids or different blends of fatty acids for helping partition more or less energy to the mammary gland versus body weight. Maybe that's where we go more in the future. I'd like to maybe do a study where we took, let's say, a high palmitic supplement versus a mixture of palmitic and oleic and, and blended them at different ratios to see what effect that may have on uh, partitioning. Um, Interesting. But certainly, the more unsaturated a fat supplement, the more chance you have of it of depressing milk fat. Yep. So, uh, okay. You know, I can see why some people are saying that. And again, the same ties in with the feed intake that we were talking about, the gut peptides. Okay. Excellent. I think that completes our discussion of the polls. We'll go back to the questions. I know that we have some here in the United States. I'm going to unmute Tom Taluki, and he can ask his own questions. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Thank you you say uh-oh, Adam. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm kind of curious. You've been doing all this research on palmitic versus carrot. Why, why did you go down that path instead of... 
Well, that's the path, as I just said a minute ago, I'm wanting to walk up now. Um, I think I went down that path then um, at that given time because that was where some of the questions were coming from. You know, there were these mix at that back, you know, six, seven years ago, just when I was move, moving here to Michigan State. Um, the the only saturated commercial saturated fat supplements out there were the mixtures of palmitic and stearic, <clears throat> and then the high palmitic, which are starting to come in. So the question was, well, are, do palmitic and stearic have the same effect? You know, and at first glance, you'd say, well, why would they have any differences? They're both saturates. One has 16 carbons, the other has 18 carbons. But I hope I clearly show tonight that there are some significant differences there. So where I want to go next is kind of on what Marcelo picked up on, twofold with oleic acid. I'm wondering if we can get a little bit more of those unsaturates past the room and can we improve digestibility? That's obviously a plus, especially for stearic. I mean, stearic acid digestibility just drops dramatically the more stearic acid there is coming out of the rumen. But also, if maybe with blends of palmitic and lake, can we have some impacts on partitioning? And, you know, maybe you then take choice between different blends of different supplements, or there's some new supplements that get produced in the future that may be targeted to partitioning differently. But no, I agree, that's the road that needs to be looked at more going forward now. All right, well, here, here's another one for you that, uh, <laughs> as, as you know, I, I've been playing around trying to figure out what to do with that model. Mm -hmm. and, and it is just so confusing when you start going through all this data and we see some pretty significant differences in this partitioning based on fatty acid profiles that were fed and stage of lactation. And I, I get, unless you know of some, and I would love to see them, Adam, uh, full lactation studies comparing some of these different. So full lactation studies, yep. Um, maybe that's something AMTS could sponsor. <laughs> I'm sure there's a few laughs there somewhere. So that, they're going to be hard to do in the future um, unless they're on farm type studies. Um, you know, I've heard some some people criticize some of our palmitic work, palmitic acetine works because we typically have 21 day periods. Um, but I know of no biological reason why we wouldn't continue to see that milk fat yield response after 21 or 28 days. Um, feedback I hear from commercial situations is they don't see those drop-offs. You have to be careful mm -hmm. when you're just looking at month-to-month -month data when you're taking into account seasonality. Um, so I think it's going to be hard to see full lactation studies. Um, now clearly there are going to be some differences uh, based on stage of lactation and priority for nutrient use at any given time. Um, but I think we can Start to un we're, we're we're understanding that biology better now from you know you know the shorter term studies and we just need to piece some of that together. Um, one of the things uh, a student of mine now actually from Brazil, Jonas de Souza, some of you may know him, um, came from São Paulo. Um, he's just doing now some meta regression work, um, taking. I think about eight or nine, he just showed me some results today, some eight or nine studies from our own lab here where we fed the palmitic acid supplements. And it's kind of a meta-analysis, but taking all individual cow responses rather than just treatment means. And I think that way, Tom, we may start to be able to get some more predictive type equations, I think, which is what you're after, and which is a breakdown on most models right now is being predicting the actual response in terms of fat and protein, et cetera. Um, some of that type of data um, in the future, we could maybe have to get some better predictions on some of this. But whole lactation studies, um, I don't think you're going to see many of them come out in the near future, I'm afraid. Oh, I know. I know. Well, the, the, you know, it's not just the predictive responses, Adam. It's predicting abomasal 
a huge challenge in itself. Yeah. I mean, the big, I mean, uh, it's not maybe not a black box, but it's a very dark box is the room is the rumor. I mean, in terms of the individual fatty acids, I think right now at best we can have on the outflows is total fatty acids and then 16 and 18 carbon fatty acids and what those 18 carbons are in between. I, I don't think we understand the biology well enough right now. We're starting to get some ideas with these differences in pH shifting pathways. Um, but again, there aren't too many. The um, meta-analysis that's going to be available online soon that Jackie did, um, that took all of the available duodenal flow data that we could find in, in lactate and dairy cows from the last 30 years, and I think we had 18 studies. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's the same yeah, as the last paper. That's not much. So no. maybe we need to rely more on in the future of um, total track data where we can get total 18 carbon and 16 carbon, but uh, we're kind of getting into the weeds a little bit here now, maybe. So, so not even really worry about steric versus oleic flows, just total 18? In terms of, yes, I think so. Um, but the caveat, knowing that from, from this data we're having now, is that in terms of digestibility, the driver for, in my opinion right now, the driver for lower reduced fatty acid digestibility with greater intake of, it, of fatty acids and greater duodenal flow is reduction in stearic acid as the in as the as the amount as the grams per day of stearic acid um, available for absorption increases we're seeing big drop-offs in stearic acid digestibility which i think is the driver for total fatty acid digestibility i have one more for you looking at some of those studies two percent or even one and a half percent supplementation is a hell of a lot of fat going in. That's at the higher level, yeah. I mean, that could be a pound at some of, for some of them. So yeah. <clears throat> you guys have to crunch the numbers on some of that. But, you know, up to one and a half, it was a linear response pretty much. Um, so I certainly wouldn't go higher, but you can, you can perhaps go. You're pretty confident in that linear response up to that one and a half percent. On the main effect, I mean, I didn't get into the details of it there, but um, we actually saw w w with lower fat diets, we got a, a slightly greater response at the very low intake, at the very uh, lowest um, fat supplementation. That gets into the situation, a question of sometimes do we not have enough fat in the diet? You know, is this drive to lower fat more and more for, to avoiding milk fat depression to sometimes do we not have enough in there to help maximize milk fat synthesis? So that's kind of a another question there we're getting into. I, I agree. And, and you know, it's funny seeing some of those poll results from Argentina. I can partially explain that. They have so much stellar soy. Sorry, Tom, yeah. carry on. Oh, no, well, I was just going to say, it's gonna, that, that soy range is anywhere from, from 5 to 17% total fat. So I, I'm hoping just on some of this partitioning and from a more commercial slide here, I'm hoping to show uh, some new data that we're just finishing up at uh, Cornell Nutrition Conference, looking at some different blends of commercial supplements and effects on partitioning. So hopefully I can cool. show that at uh, the October. All right, I'm done. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, Marcelo, I'm gonna unmute you. Do you have some questions? Yes, you have so many that I'm going to have to do two at a time, okay? Yes, that'd be fine. Just summarize a little bit as much as we can here. Uh, cotton seed with high unsaturated fat, uh, what would be your recommendation for maybe 18.1 or 18.2 or unsaturated total fat coming from cotton seed because uh, we assume it has a slow release? And also, since we're going that pathway, we're recommendation for total fat and individual fat. C16, 18, 18.1, and 18.2 uh, on a lactation diet. Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I'm going to say that I don't think there are any magic numbers. I, I don't have a magic number for a linoleic acid grams per day that if you keep it below a certain level you're going to avoid milk fat depression because I don't think that's possible uh, when you think that you only need maybe two or three grams of some of these CLAs coming out the rumen to have a 
20, 25% reduction in milk fat, you, that's never going to be an overall, uh, that's never going to be possible. And, and I don't think you, you want to do that. Um, now, I do think going forward that there may be some ideal profiles of playing around with some of those. I do think getting more palmitic acid in the diet is going to increase and energy partitioning to milk. Um, and I, I'd sift you to that as on a percent of dry matter basis. And as Tom and I were talking, up, up to 1.5%, we're seeing in, in continual increases. And then that's dropping off. So that tells me again that we're losing maybe some ideal profile there. Um, but in terms of magic numbers, in terms of some of the unsaturates, I don't think there are any. You know, you can find 100 pound average dairy cow herds that are average and, you know, three, three and a half percent till fatty acids, but some may be up at five percent. Um, I think it's all about finding the balance. I do, but I do think cotton seed was one that was mentioned there. You can feed more fatty acids, I think, from cotton seed than you could that, that same amount of unsaturated fat coming from distillers grains, for example. And I think that's because of that rate of release with all the other ingredients. So starch um, and what impact that's having on rubric pH. But I'm afraid I don't have, or I certainly don't give mathematic numbers for any of this. Um, as we move forward with some of this prediction, work, maybe there will be some predictions that would tell us that for every, let's say, 100 gram increase in palmitic acid intake, you might get an X gram improvement in fat yield or or, or some of those different things. But um, I, think it, I think it's all about balance. I'm sorry I don't have hard numbers. If, if Charlie Smith is on the line, he, he would always ask me what was my magic number for grams per day in oleic or oleic acid in the diet for avoiding milk fat depression. And I think it's hard to Hard to make the numbers, but for any nutritionist in any given situation and their own feeding philosophy, maybe in those given situations you can come up with some benchmarks of your own under your own situation. So okay, that's where I think that, that's where I think the model can help in terms of helping you keep a checks and balance on what's the total fatty acid in, in taking my diet, how much of each fatty acid is that coming from and where in the diet are those, uh, which ingredients are driving those fatty acid intake. That's, I think, the biggest use right now of that lipid submodel in the, in, in, in the model. Thank you. Okay. Marcella, do you have more questions? Yes. I mean, okay. And I'm here. going to, after you ask your question, I'm going to mute you because there's a lot of background noise that makes it hard to hear. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, would you comment a little bit on the type of fatty acid that you would recommend to improve fertility and if also uh, calcium soap of or any kind of fat would, uh, would, would have do any effect on fertility? Okay, good question. Um, so when I look at the data, I mean a lot of um, the Florida group uh, Doctors Thatcher's, uh, Staples, and uh, Jose Santos have done a huge amount of the work in that area, and, and as have others. Um, in general, when I when I see some of their work and some of their reviews, in general, fat supplement that they say that fat supplementation improves reproductive um, efficiency. Um, but they would also then say the more unsaturates tend to give a better improvement in a, in, in reproduction. Um, I think there's evidence and support, not just from the, from the ruminant literature, but from the human literature as well, about maybe being able to supply some of the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids to that early lactation cow that, that you may be able to have some beneficial effects on reproduction. Um, and you can see there's some good points for the omega-6 and the omega-3. Certainly some of these very high producing um, dairy cows um, can at times actually may potentially be somewhat stressed maybe for some of those omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Um, of course, the thing you have to be very careful, especially with some of those very long chain omega-3 fish oil based supplements, um, potential effects on milk fat depression or milk fat can be quite severe. 
So I think you, sometimes it's hard to weigh out some of the balance with some of that um, on what what sometimes is maybe causing the beneficial or what is the the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's driving any beneficial effect on reproduction if you have a very low milk fat as well? Because in that case, you're then sparing energy that's no longer going out into milk. So it might not just be the biological effect of a given fatty acid on the repro system, but it may be simply an energy sparing effect as well from lower milk fat. So that has to be weighed up. But I think the biology there is quite good. Um, Adam, I have a question from Marty Traxler, and he's down in Mexico. Um, the 1.5% supplementation of palmitic acid can be supplied through a combination of sources, high palmitic fatty acids plus calcium salt, or from a 16-0 source only. And is this combination of high 16-0 supplement, supplement with palm oil, calcium salt preferred to soil, soy oil? Sorry. Yep, that's okay. That's a good question. Um, so in that dose response study that I showed, that one and a half percent dry matter was from feeding a 85 percent palmitic acid supplement, a commercially available um, palmitic free fatty acid supplement. Now certainly you could get that by blending it in with a calcium salt product. Um, and I've actually, especially, certainly when I was out out west uh, end of last year. Um, I was hearing more and more of that from a cost and from a response perspective where they were taking one of these high palmitic acid supplements and a calcium salt or palm oil and blending them together. And uh, as Tom talked about earlier on, and as um, uh, we talk, as uh, Marcelo talked about, maybe there's some opportunities there. But I'd say if you were going to do a blend like that, I'd probably do it more with a, with a high palm alongside a calcium salt or palm oil. To give you because you're going to get more with the palmitic there, and then rather than the soy oil, because with the palm oil you're bringing in oleic acid as opposed to more linoleic acid with the soy oil. So I hope that. So, Marcella, do you have more questions? Yes, I'll make sure that I'm here to make it okay. faster. Uh, what would be the difference between calcium soap of soybean and palm, and also is there a difference between protected fat? in terms of the power to prevent biohydrogenation of, of commercial products? <clears throat> okay, a couple of good questions. Uh, just quickly on that one, the di big difference between a calcium salt, palm oil, and soy oil, they're going to have a fairly similar level of palmitic acid. Um, the palm oil, the other major fatty acid is oleic acid, whereas in soybean oil, 50-55% um, is linoleic acid. Um, we have to be, I think you have to be careful with the term rumen protected because people have changed what that term means the last few years. Tip, when those calcium salt products were first uh, brought out, that term rumen protection or rumen inertness referred to more of, not, of those fatty acids having a less of a negative effect on the bacteria. Um, whereas now people are trying to are using that term to say that those fatty acids are protected and passing through the, the room and unchanged. In general, I would say that the level of biohydrogenation of an unsaturated fatty acid in the calcium salt product isn't that dissimilar to if you fed the parent oil on its own, 80, 75 to 95% of the unsaturated fatty acids in a calcium salt product are still going to be biohydrogenated. Now, you may be able to feed a slightly higher level in the calcium salt, and you may also have slightly less effect on alternative biohydrogenation or less of an effect on intake. But you're not necessarily, don't, you shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that 100% of that fatty acid you're feeding in one of those products is going to leave the room and has that same fatty acid, it's certainly not. When I have milk fat depression, I should expect an increase in body condition score. I think he's going through the insaturated fat, uh, uh, going toward more the carcass. And the other one is if yeah. I add sugar to the diet, should I improve biohydrogenation? <clears throat> so the first one is I, I think Assuming that you're seeing no big drop off in energy intake in a milk fat depression situation or a reduction in digestibility, you will always 
um, a, a milk fat depression situation is always going to result in a repartition of, of energy. And you're going to see that manifested in an increased body condition or body weight, I think. The sugars, I mentioned that I, I know one or two studies that have used uh, molasses and have shown a slight improvement in milk fat, um, which one would assume is because of um, effects on biohydrogenation. Um, limited data so far, um, but there, there is some promising data there, and maybe that's an opportunity to try and pull out some of the starch and replace with sugar. That may, may have some help, but again, I don't have any concrete evidence either way on that. Back to you, Marcella. Okay. Um, this is a question from Marty Traxler again. Does the particle size of the protected fat affect the digestibility within the rumen, for example, gran granular versus a meal or a powder? <clears throat> ah, another good question. Um, so that's interesting. Um, we actually had an abstract at Dairy Science this year where we where a company in Malaysia made for us a palmitic acid enriched supplement, so about 88% palmitic acid at three different prill sizes. So the largest one was similar to what's commercially available mostly right now for the high palmitics and also the, um, the mix of palmitic and stearics. And then we made two, two that were smaller, and of course they all have ranges. We didn't see any differences there. Um, Across, in terms of production responses, and just some very, very small differences in digestibility. There's some older data with hydrogenated tallow showing that some much larger prills and or some larger flakes have lower digestibility. Um, there was one study come out of um, Canada from Yvonne Schwinar's um, group at, in uh, Orlando at the Dairy Science Meeting this year, where they basically just sieved through some fine sieves, a calcium salt, I think it was a calcium salt, soybean oil, and it was the, the and then fed them back to the cow with the different particle sizes of, of a calcium salt, and the and those with a larger particle size actually had more bypass of the unsaturated fatty acid than those with the smaller particle size. But in terms of the commercial saturated krills, I have not seen anything on krill size so much right now. Uh, thank you. Um, let me see if Marcelo has more. Marcelo, more questions? True here is a maybe another mechanism. Uh, when I have cows producing low amount of milk, it would go for 616, and high producing cows would go for C18. And if I'm using calcium soap, that uh, I should increase calcium in the diet. Say that second question again. Sorry, I was thinking about my answer. When I use calcium soap or any kind of soap, should I increase the calcium level in the diet? That's a, you know, yeah, I mean, so oh, would you drop the other calcium in the diet? Yeah, I mean, I think you would. I think that's fairly, that's probably fairly common to do. So you're meeting, you know, recommendations for overall calcium. There's no point feeding excess calcium. I think. The first no, the question, question, the question with the other round. Um, when you use that, because people think that the the soap would complex and will take some of the calcium out, would you increase the calcium in the diet? Oh, I've never heard that before. I don't think you would. I okay. mean, the, those those fatty acids are associating, dissociating all the time with with the calcium um, in the rumen. In fact, most of the time, fatty free fatty acids are associated with a metal ion, a metal ion in the rumen most of the time. So I, I don't think that's an issue. Um, now, the first question. <clears throat> I, as I said earlier, I have not done a trans, an early lactation study with palmitic acid yet. That's a hole we have in our data. Um, but from post-peak cows, you know, we've done studies from anywhere from 150 pounds of milk down to 60 pounds in milk. I, my personal thing right now is I'd feed palmitic acid over stearic acid in all of those post-peak situations. Uh, Pre-peak pre right now, I think certainly the data on stearic acid in there would certainly help part, minimize body condition score loss, but I think potentially you're not going to, those cows aren't going to peak so high based on some of the work from Mike Allen's group and Paula right now that we've done collaboratively. Um, so you have to remember when we did the across production levels from 60 to 150 pounds when we fed, when we had a palmitic acid a stearic acid or a palmitic versus stearic, the palmitic always outperformed the, the stearic 
across those, even though Styrix still improved production in the highest cows. When we did the direct comparison, Palmitic still had a higher production than the Styrix. Um, <clears throat> understanding some of these digestibility effects, I think, are going to be important, and also looking at the effects of Palmitic in that early lactation cow. Um, how, how will partitioning of energy in that early lactation cow go between milk and body weight? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I hear some different things from the field on that, but it's hard to know exactly right now. But I would probably go more of the palmitic than the steric in that post. Thank you. Okay, Marcelo, you have any more? Last one. Uh, during the transition period, would you comment a little bit, maybe prep? Then, uh, right after part and postpartum, and if we have anything new on for calves, on fat for calves. Uh, in that very early lactation period. So that's interesting. Um, so the power study, um, Mike's, Mike's PhD student, uh, when she fed the, the mix of palmitic and steric, the saturated pre commercial one, from zero to, I think it was 28 days in calf, um, 28 days into lactation, sorry. Um, those cows did not, and then followed them out, they did not lose as much body weight or body condition, but then they didn't milk as much. And that was at two different levels of forage NDF. It was better in the higher forage NDF diet. The, the challenge there is, is weighing up, you know, that lost condition there versus not peaking so high in milk. Um, this study fed from 21 days on and saw a greater partitioning with that same palmitic steric supplement, um, a greater partitioning to milk in the high concentrate diet, whereas the high forage diet, diet had the greater partitioning to body weight. Um, so, you know, I think the jury's out there on that very, very early lactation, but you can certainly maximize that energy, extra energy in some of those fats, you know, maybe a little, a little way out, further out in that transition period. I think that's something we need to look at uh, further there. In terms of calves, I've seen some data come out recently about, you know, maybe some of the fatty acids that a cow's, a cow's producing into her colostrum may be having some effects on the calf in terms of health parameters. And, maybe, and I think that might be a, an area of interest going forward. Um, I'm not the right guy to be asking, I'm afraid, about, you know, um, the amount of fat or protein in um, calf milk replaces in terms of growth rates, et cetera. Across all of this, though, I would say one area, you know, one question came up about the repro side earlier on, which I think is interesting. But I think even potentially a more exciting opportunity going forward might be if we could deliver some of these omega-3 or omega-6 to the cow in terms of having a health, a health or immune response effect in early vaccination. I think there's some especially when we look at the human data, there's some exciting opportunities there. But the, the challenge, as we've discussed, and many of you picked up in those, some of those poll questions, is we'd have to deliver them um, in, a, in a formulation that gave, offered some fairly good protection so we didn't see some of these other negative effects that you may see. But I think we might see some more data on the immune response coming out more in the future that may, may be very exciting. All right. Thank you, Dr. Locke. I think um, in regards to the calf and feeding, we're, we're actually looking, putting together our list of people for next year, and I think we're going to try to see if we can get a talk on calf feeding. Um, I believe that we don't have any more questions at this point. I do want to emphasize that we get a really good response from across the globe. I know that we've had a fellow listening to us from Germany, and um, Dr. Traxler is down in Mexico, but happens to be in Panama right now. So we have really good response. Um, I'm going to unmute Paula and Marcelo so that they can thank you, but we'll soon bring this webinar to a close. I want to thank you for your, your great um, effort. You certainly have gone above and beyond. I know it was a challenge this, this week. So here's Paula and Marcelo. Okay, I, I I want to thank Adam and obviously Marcelo and Marian. Uh, as we had a lot of trouble with the audio, uh, I think we missed some parts. And uh, if you are if you agree with me and Dr. Locke, I would ask the, the audience 
if they have any questions after reading or after listening the recording webinar, uh, they can write uh, to us and we can ask you some questions. Yes, that would be fine. Okay, perfect, and thank you very much. All right, thank you, Paula, and, and again, thanks for, for all the work you do on this. Marcelo? I think it was another great webinar, Dr. Locke. Uh, it was such a, so many good things and good information that uh, we're going to have to review the webinar again uh, because they're so, such a great job. Thank you so much. Thank the team, Mary and Tom, everybody. Paula and everybody in Brazil that was listening. It was a great two and a half hours with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. And um, I really appreciate it. When Tom jumps in, it's always nice to have a little bit of back and forth. Thank you, Dr. Locke. I look forward to seeing you at the CNC next month. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad I avoided any negative comments about English soccer teams as well. So <laughs> yeah, that's always good. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending. We'll sign out now. Thank you.